today we're talking to Carvis Tarabi uh, from Cardiacs, uh, specifically about the Cardiacs film, some fairy tales from the Rotten Shed. Now, the, the set that it covers is material exclusively written before 1984. Well, um, I didn't realise, but Tim had sort of had had this idea that he wanted to perform pr pretty much all the stuff, apart from, if you know the Cardiacs law, apart from the piffle pieces, I think it was pretty much all the stuff that they had performed from back in those days, you know, up until sort of 1984. I think he was never really happy with the, the original recordings of them. And so he had this idea that he wanted to do these, you know, to perform everything and record it. Um, at this point, the guitarist in Cardiacs was, the, the second guitarist in Cardiacs was John Poole. Uh, but he'd got very busy playing with Ginger Wildheart. I think he might have even joined the Wildhearts at this point. And for whatever reason, John couldn't do it. Um, so Tim asked me, it, you know, if I'd like to do it. And um, I, I said, yeah, of course. So I don't think it was, it wasn't necessarily the case that I joined Cardiacs at that point, but that I was going to do this stuff. And yeah. there was, there was about 36 songs to learn. I mean, I knew most of it, but I didn't know most of it to play it. So it was uh, it was amazing actually to learn to learn those thirty six songs over the period. Of, I think we started rehearsing. I think we started rehearsing in the summer um, weekly, and we did the gigs. When was it? Was it October? October. October. Yeah. And so what would happen would be um, I'd give myself a song each night to learn. So you know by ear. So I, I was working, so I'd come in from work, have my dinner, and then go to my room, my studio, and uh, just work on one song until I completely got it. Did, did you get any notes or transcription? Or were you just doing it no, all, all no, by listening? Yeah, I mean, basically what it was, I was working on, I mean, I'd, you know, talk, talk to Tim about it. I would ring him a lot, but that's the, that's the universal symbol of ring. Still. Ring him up. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on the, on the really early stuff, on the stuff when it was Colvin Mayers in the band, then I was working out his keyboard parts. But uh, sometimes I'd be working out some of Sarah Sachs' parts on the guitar, and other times I'd just be doing the chords. Or yeah, yeah so it, it was a mixture of, of stuff. Tim had I knew what Tim was doing, so I just did the sort of complementary parts. Well, what was quite nice about it was, you know, while, while you, obviously you don't change the parts, but what was nice is that there was so much stuff that Tim kind of gave Bob and I, Bob Leith, the drummer. A, a kind of a free reign. It was. It was all like, well, well, you know what to do. I mean, there were there were instances where, for, for Bob, for instance, where there was, um, I think it was on my trademark. There was like loads of drum fills, and Tim just said, Bob, by all means, if you want to just play it completely straight and don't do those drum fills, yeah. not only would I be happy, I would prefer it. Yeah. So, because some of those some of those early songs were quite scar inflected, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, and, that's and so right. Maybe yeah. taking some of that out of it because it was very much of its time. I don't know if it was so much that. I, I think that you know, but it, 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 I can't remember exactly what we discussed about it. But it was certainly, you know, treat it as if you know, we're treating it as if they were kind of new songs to learn. Yeah. So I was, I was kind of, you know, like I said, I would never change the tunes, but I was very much playing it in my style well, and finding out what worked best. Sometimes yeah. I double what Tim was doing. Sometimes I do an octave with with Tim. Other times I put in, you know, we'd, well, just to go back to l the learning them. So, so I'd learn them on one day, one tune. Then the following day, I'd learn another tune. And then at the end of the day, run the two of them. Yeah. And then the next day, I'd learn another one and three tunes. So each, as, as it came along each week, I'd be learning, you know, five songs. And then we'd go up to, we'd go up to Salisbury where Tim, you know, Tim's place, uh, Paul Perrow. And then we'd run what we'd learned. And then the following week, I'd learn another five, and da, 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 and, and and so it built up. Well, some of these recordings were really bad. I mean, the, I'd never heard the song "An Ant" before. I'd heard most of them because I had some bootlegs and things, but I'd never heard "An Ant" before, and the recording was really, really bad. So on that one, Tim had to show me how to play it. But of course, the other thing with Tim is Tim writes everything out in music. You know, he scores everything right from the beginning. Everything had been scored, so anything that I'd had trouble with. He'd get the, you know, when we were at, I'd get up to his, usually go up to his place on Friday night. Um, and then whatever he'd, you know, what anything I'd had trouble with, he'd get the notes out, you know, get the notes out and go on. Oh, no, I think it's like this. And so so he, that, he, that he, he already had scores. Of, he kept yeah. scores of all the material. Everything. 
Wow. Yeah, yeah, you know, he scored everything right, right from the beginning. All the, even the, the, the crazy, crazy kind of like stuff that just sounds like a wreck. It was all scored out. But he was, and I think he was self-taught. Wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He from, from um, I think it was Quadrophenia. Basically, what he did was, you know, he's really into the Who, um, and I think it was Quadrophenia that he got the score for Quadrophenia and followed it along when he when he was a kid. You know, followed the score for Quadrophenia along with the record, and that that's how he taught himself to write music, read and write music. And just by, by necessity, because once he got, you know, once, you know, much later on when the, the sort of, he got a computer, then he stopped, he stopped scoring everything. But he would always, you know, he, he'd always, that, that's how Tim thinks. He thinks in scores. I always learn by ear. Uh, John, John Paul was the same. John just learns by ear. Yeah. So most of the stuff I could learn by ear um, of, of, the, of that early stuff. But yeah, anything that was just that recordings were a little bit too, just too kind of hard to make out. Then, yeah. then Tim, Tim would get the, the score out dig out these really old bits of, you know, this sort of a manuscript and go, oh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's this, you know, sort of thing. You were Cardiac's guitar tech for, yeah. for a while. How, how long were you guitar tech for? Um, I think I came on board, uh, <clears throat> I came on board just before the Chumbawamba tour. I think about, was it 95, 94, 95, I think it was. So yeah, I was, I was basically always at those gigs from, from 90, whenever it was, 95. I was just two metres to the, to the left of beforehand, so I just yeah. all I did is I moved I, I moved two meters, but yeah. I, I took a demotion because you got paid less for being in the band than the crew got paid. Yeah. So I was demoted to guitarist <laughs> um, in Cardiacs. But um, uh, what was what was really nice was that also because obviously you know John Paul was such a kind of important figure in for Cardiacs and, and such, such an amazing you know all round musician. That had I joined the band, and you know replaced him, you know replaced him, and and was, was playing the same set that Cardex were doing in around that time, you know which would have been the stuff from Guns and Sing to God and everything up to that point. Had had I joined the band then, I think the differences between John and I would have been very striking. What was what was lovely for me was to join and do all this early stuff. So obviously there was a small overlap. There was like icky qualms, and there was uh, you know is this life? Of course and um, to go off and things, you know, that sort of thing. But, but generally, no one had heard John Paul play any of these songs that I was, I was playing. So I really felt like, I really felt like I could make it my own. And I wouldn't, I, I felt so grateful that I, I didn't get judged by what John had done, because I could never be, I still can never be John Paul. I could only ever be me. Yeah. And uh, what was also nice is that I would, when we were rehearsing, I'd, I'd put in these silly things as a joke, like pinched harmonics, and Tim would just go, do that, do that. I said, really? No, do that. Or there's a bit in, um, you know, there's a bit in um, A Bus for a Bus for a Bus where I go, ja, ja, dun, 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 dun. just did a like, silly little metal chugging, and Tim was like, yeah, do that, do that. So he was very, very keen on kind of, you know, w whatever I was bringing attitude-wise for me to really inject my attitude to the point that I would not normally do those sort of chugs or pinched harmonics, but Tim was, loved all that. And he's like, yeah, yeah, and, and definitely and do it's it. It's funny, watching the um, XTC documentary, This Is Pop, where uh, Dave yeah. Gregory talks about um, Andy Partridge telling him not to play sort of blues licks. Was there anything, yeah. was there anything like that that where he went, no, or was it all no, positive? No, 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 because I mean, the thing is, the thing is, I, you know, at this point, you know, Tim and I had been friends at this point for, you know, over 10 years. He'd produced my band. He was a big, he was a big fan of my music. He, you know, he loved my stuff. So he knew, he knew kind of what my style was. So I think, it, no, there, there was, and I, but also you know, I'm a huge, you know, the Cardex was my band. So there, there was no way I'd, I'd, I'd want to put anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the, the, funnily enough, you know, just change the same thing in Gong as a, as a even though the, the gong that I do is kind of different from the old gong, I, I've kind of got, I'm aware of what, you know, where you can stretch things out yeah. and, and what wouldn't be allowed sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, what's true. Yeah, you, yeah. I think that's the thing, isn't it, is you've come in first and foremost initially maybe as a fan, so you really understand the aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'd seen, I'd seen every single, with, with the exception of one where I had another gig, one Glastonbury I, I, I couldn't take. But apart from that, I had seen every single Cardiacs gig from the side of the stage and rehearsals and everything since 1994. So I knew exactly, and, and, and these were all my best friends, these guys, you know, and I toured with them, they were my gang. So I knew, you know, I wasn't coming into it as a, as a complete stranger at all. I knew, I knew exactly what was, you know, required. And Tim and I were very, very close, you know, so we, and we talked to, we, you know, we talked about this stuff all the time. So I, I kind of, 
the, the pressure was really just how the fans would feel. But even then, the fans knew me. I didn't come in as a stranger because my band, the Monsoon Bassoon, had, had played with Cardiacs. And, and people sort of, you know, there was a crossover with people coming to our gigs. So I felt kind of quite blessed that I didn't get that kind of, where's John, where's John, you know? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, I know John got a bit of, where's Sarah? Because I saw John's first gig. Yeah. But I, I, I was lucky, really, because I didn't get that. I mean, mostly they knew who I was, I think. Uh, it's, it's funny it's funny saying it because it's reminded me that on that first tour that John did, I sat down in a, uh, when they played in Liverpool and listened to John's story about how he got into yeah. Cardiacs. And it's very different. You know, Through he, ad nauseum. And, yeah, because yeah. he ad nauseum. So much more of a sort of distant fan. And yeah. I, think he'd, I think he'd filled in his CV or whatever and, and, and got the call. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, but a very, a very, very different... But it's funny because well, I hadn't no, thought about that for, for decades. The funny thing was I stopped being a fan... Um, when I when I became part of the band, I didn't I didn't stop loving the music at all, but I stopped being a fan fan because once you've seen behind the curtain, th these were my friends. So I, I came in, I felt like a cardiac, you know. But yeah. at the point I joined, I, I sort of I already felt like a cardiac because I'd been part of the gang for ten years, and it wasn't just the gigs. It's like, you know Tim being in London, you know we would you know we would be hang, you know hanging out together and going to gigs all the time, you know. Yeah. So we, we'd be, you know, we'd see each other every week kind of thing until he moved to, to Salisbury. And then we'd still see each other, you know, regularly anyway. So This set, uh, which had been with your sort of baptism of fire, you'd started playing this set. Um, there were the garage gigs. And then I think a year later, the same set was played. There were secret gigs. At, at the, the Bull and Gate. Gate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was there sitting on the floor along with everyone else. Yeah. Um, and, and then this, this the, the, um, the, the Rotten Shed film was a film of that set which again is only it's all the material pre-1984 mm -hmm. um may, maybe you could consider it a sister film to mare's nest because mare's nest has got all the hits on it and maybe this is the earlier things is that sort of part of the thinking about the making of this film do you think i don't know uh, i don't know what the i don't know tim had had the had had the idea that we're going to do we're going to film a rehearsal um, but I think we'd recently we'd been recently playing this stuff, so it was it was it was fresh. We didn't have to do we didn't have to do too much homework, yeah. and I re I remember. But unfortunately, the with the tragic events of two thousand and eight and everything that's happened since, I remember us filming as well. Well, definitely, gloomy news was filmed in the for the rotten shed stuff, because you see, when we put it out on YouTube before Tim's terrible accident. We put a few tasters on YouTube just to sort of get people kind of, you know, yeah. excited. And I think you, you hear us, you hear us coming out of gloomy news before one of them, I think it's cold as can be. Cold as can, yeah. yeah. So those are the two. And there's cold as can be. What's, what's the other? And then we did Jibber and Twitch. Yeah. So those are um, the two that were released yeah. years, years before. Yeah. Because the film was almost finished. Yeah, yeah. And then, there were, but it didn't get finished because of yeah. what happened. But we put those out. But I, I'm pretty sure there was, we also did, the two things I remember, and they're both, the two songs that didn't make it and have been lost, but I remember us filming and I remember seeing them edited, were um, Hope Day and To Go Off and Things, and both for completely egotistical reasons. That there's a bit in Hope Day where it goes, the key the keys go diddle 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 diddle. And I remember when we were rehearsing this originally, I said to Tim, "Shall I play that on guitar?" And I knew it was sort of beyond me. It's going to Steve Vai start. Well, not quite, but you know. And Tim said, oh, if you could, you could you? And, I, and so that really, I thought, well, that's it. I'm going to do it. So I do a little, 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 little. And I remember there being a close up on my fingers in the rehearsal when we were, when it was, I remember watching it back and going, oh, yeah, that looks good. Yeah, you know, yeah, I was just that. playing that. Yeah, 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 there, there, that was worth it. And then I also remember that we did took off and things because, again, there was a, there was a, I can't remember what, whether Tim, there was a monochrome section. It was a bit sort of went really strange and monochrome, but there was a particularly flattering shot of me. And I remember thinking, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait for this DVD to come out. Yeah. Especially, well, you know, the stuff, uh, there's not many opportunities to look gorgeous. In you know, cardiac, it's, 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 yeah. yeah. In cardiac, so it's, it's that, you know, it's got that very nervous, wide angle, uh, high Sweaty, contrast. Sweaty, awkward, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, if you do look good, you would want to seize those. It was it was just one shot, mine. But yeah, yeah. yeah I remember that. But um, Paul Morricone said, "This is all. This is all I had to work with. This is all I had." Oh, there's, there's this stupid, you know, skit I used to do about Have you seen Winston Churchill ascending? Yes, yes. 
this skit I did, which, which, uh, and the idea was that, that Tim had, to, you know, was that I would be telling lots of different people this skit, this story about this gotcha. stupid tune that I'd come yeah. up with. Have you seen Winston Churchill's any? And whenever we were around at Paul Perrow doing whatever, I'd, I'd tell this. So at one point we were at Paul Perrow, I can't remember why, but there were all these um, dancers female dancers staying at Polpero. I can't remember why, because Polpero is a big place. And at one point, Tim was like, you've got to tell him the story. So he got the camera out and he, was just, he said to them, look really bored. Yeah. And so there's a bit where I'm saying to the, all these girls, oh yes, yeah, this is story, what it was, in the trenches. Da, da, da. And then another time, and then we recorded a number of this on a number of yeah. occasions. I think the idea being that it would have been cut together increasingly, yeah. me animated and just different people, the camera going back, different people just like, right. but. The only one that could be found was me telling Simon from Johnny Four because, well, I'd been producing Johnny Four, and Tim had been Tim was mixing it and I was producing it, and I think they then got asked to do. Oh look, can you do a can you do a sort of a, a, a kind of extended version of one of the songs? So we just recorded it at Tim. So I think that's why they were around, but they were they were friends anyway. They yeah. they toured with. Carly so that so that's the answer to that question is who who are you talking to by the fire? That's Simon. Simon. Simon it, from it does Johnny say Ball. recipient of if you look at it. Yeah, Simon from Simon Ball from Johnny Four. Yeah. It's and he's credited as what? That something like I remember Paul Morricone saying, "Well, what should we call?" Recipient of Churchill, uh, not endurance. Recipient of Ch ordeal. Something like recipient <laughs> of Churchill ordeal. Simon Ball. But yeah, the guitar player from Johnny Four. They were a great band. They were really good. Yeah. Uh, Tim's uh, Wild Hearts video, which oh, came yeah. out on DVD. Yeah. I I tried to buy that and accidentally bought the record instead of the DVD, which made me cross. Okay. <laughs> but the, the, the clips I've seen of it, it looks very very similar. Yeah. Visually. Yeah, to, yeah. To, to uh, Rotten Shed. Well, what happened was, um, you know, we we, uh, we we filmed all the you know the Rotten Shed stuff all got filmed, um, and then Tim edited all the Tim edited all the tunes. They were all cut down and some of the um, kind of interlinking stuff had all been edited. Jim plugging the bass in and what have you. Um, Jim's shame because we put that on with the, with the microphone. That, that went onto YouTube as well. But not, not all of them. Um, and Ginger was around there making, Ginger was always making records around at Tim's. And uh, Tim, had, Tim had shown Ginger the, um, the, the, the rushes of this, you know, we'd already done. And Ginger was like, we got to do one of these for the Wild Heart sort of thing. So that's what it was. Well, just to tie in with the Johnny Four story, that was filmed in the newly made studio, which was built by Johnny Four and myself and one of their friends. We all we came in one year, well, one summer, because they were all really good. They, they grew up in Chichester and they're all really practical and could build stuff. So it was Luke, Simon, um, I think Lee and Lee from Johnny Four, those three all had really good building skills. Me, uh, a friend of theirs, and we we just basically built that that studio, which was which was the Apollo. It was the old garage. So it's lovely to see that that studio has been immortalised for for what little stuff it had done. It got Im immortalised in that Wild Hearts film. But yeah, it looks great. Uh, and of course, Tim had worked with Scaramanga Six, of which of Paul is a member. Yeah. And so Paul helped um, finish off the edit because because of Tim's illness. Yeah. Um, Paul was able to come in, and 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 finish off the edit yeah and it was amazing time. amazing having Paul there well, he, what an incredible job he did and and also amazing to have Paul there because Tim absolutely well was, Paul's a friend of Tim's you know they're friends and Paul uh, Tim trusted Paul implicitly well you know Tim rightly you know is very very um precious about who he lets get hold of his stuff because he, he doesn't want it ruined it has to be done correctly and so having Paul to do that was, it was just amazing really and, and so do, do you know much about the process of what that was? Did Paul sort of take it away and bring it and Tim offer? Yeah, I think, notes or I think that was it. I think that was it. I think there'd been <clears throat> there'd been a bit of communication about, you know, what Tim wanted and how, how things were meant to go. I mean, Paul rang me because there was the Wince Churchill section. Yeah. And I said, well, this was the idea. And Paul said, well, there's just this fireside scene. So that, that ended up there. There was that bit had gone. Who knows? And, and some tunes were missing. Yeah, but yeah. Paul said, this is all I this is all I could sort of retrieve. So everything that they could retrieve is there. I, I, I like this idea that someday, that Hope Day and, you know, yeah. gloomy new, news and, and the two other things turns up. Yeah. And Paul, obviously, he, he is it Paul who does most of the video stuff for Sky Magazine? Yeah, Cause yeah. Because, they, again, their videos are, are fantastic. Yeah, they really are. And, yeah. and, other, um, and, other, and other known 
groups. I yeah. know it's, it's you know that's what he does. Yeah. yeah. No, it's 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 great that that, that uh, you know when you've not, got someone that you not can to imply that Scaramanga aren't, things aren't known. Sorry, I mean yeah, you yeah. know groups like the These Young Knives the, uh, and yeah. what have you. So um, let's let, uh, one of the things I'm I'm interested about is in in that room where we spend that claustrophobic room that we spend the whole video. Um, you're all in quite heavy clobber. You've got your white furry coat on. Tim's got his that that great big uh, what is it? A crombie. Great coat, crombie. Oh, great, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, I always used to make me sweat looking at when he, yeah, when yeah. he was playing on stage. You should have. It, it was a lot heavier when when he came off stage than oh, when he went on. You know. <laughs> and did it get dry cleaned ever, or is <laughs> it just, just get put on again? This is Tim Smith. I doubt it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and so what was it? Was was it hot and loud? Because it seemed. Yeah. It looks like a hot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really hot and loud, really, really cramped. I mean, you know, we had um, Tim. Tim had told us what he wanted us to do because we knew we were going to be doing this like rehearsal, you know, filming a rehearsal. So I just thought, oh, we'll just wear, we'll just wear what we're going to wear and what we what I normally wear to a rehearsal, you know. Uh, and Tim said, no, no, wear that, wear that white, wear that fur coat because he knew I had it, he loved it. And then to Jim, and Jim, Jim always goes along with you know everything. He said to Jim, yeah, just your pants. And <laughs> See and would that have been the whole conversation? Yeah, the, the yeah. And Jim, Jim's just like, yeah, all right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Jim wouldn't, Jim, yeah. Jim wouldn't have protested. Yeah, yeah. The way I did when I was asked to wear a kilt. That's another. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 but so I've never seen you in a kilt. So it sounds no, like no one will. No one will. No, but so Tim can take no for an answer. Well, he had, he had to on that on the, yeah, kilt, yeah. on the kilt in the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what I love about it is that when you see, you know, when you when you see the end result. The very idea that these four men are a band and that in, in, in this, in this unin almost unendurable misery, and that's the music that they make. There's this like guy in his just his pants, and then this preening little preening peacock and he's thinking he's Mark Bolin or something, and then this like really angry guy. It was just wonderful, you know. Of, of course, always Tim's vision was you know, yeah. correct. And it's just amazing that thing that throughout it's raining you know every every pause yeah. is the dog barking and the rain that's pouring. ivy that was that's yeah, not yeah. Yeah, that was real yeah yeah, yeah. but that's <laughs> sort of yeah there's an a, a, that intense claustrophobic yeah uh, it feels uh uncomfortable oh it's one yeah, one yeah well it was it was and i had a really bad back uh when we were doing it so um not that you could see but i could remember really just you know have, having this really bad back doing it and i do a fall i do a fall during um yeah, yeah. That's a real fall, yeah. <laughs> During um, it's a tall, cold as can be. Yeah, that was real. One of the other things about the room, it's got so much clutter in it. Yeah. It's really weird because <laughs> I, I was looking at it and I could see there are like Akai samplers. Oh, there's everything. Uh, as well as, you know, a rickety old sort of harmonium. Yeah, like. that, that, yeah, that harmonium was in there anyway, yeah. but we, we wanted it to, you know, we wanted it to look, we, we spent, you know, a day or so dressing it. We wanted okay. it to look, I mean, it was a small room anyway, but we just wanted it to just be this kind of orgy of like just stuff at the wrong angle and wires. And, yeah, yeah that, the whole thing. Okay, okay, brilliant. The, the other thing to, that, that I remember, um, I saw some uh, other footage that Kathy Harabaris from Cardex had shot uh, of a Cardex rehearsal that we were doing before um, when we had the big Cardex big band, when it was um, Dawn and Mel and Claire and Kathy and then Sharon was singing. I think, can't remember which tour that was. Was it 2005? That was for the that was for the bigger story of DVD that never got finished. <clears throat> and I just remember we were all we all used to smoke constantly, fags, you know. And the room just used to stink all the time. And the thought now, I mean, Jim would smoke straight, and uh, me and Tim and Bob would be smoking ropes. Everyone would smoke all the time. So it was just this constant fug of like acrid like smoke the whole time I mean now I haven't smoked for 10 years but yeah that was my, my memory is Carnex always stank of smoke the 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 DVD um sort of loading screen yeah there's spilling and there's also oh yeah ashtray yeah, ash you get, that was all I mean, yeah <laughs> and you get you, I always get a sense that there should be more of that 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 you know yeah you know, it goes back to what you're saying about Paul working with what he had yeah but you can see there's a visual signature uh, that that um, that wants to play out. You know, there's loads of those things that look. Yeah. You know, I. You know, these sort of Tim, set pieces. Yeah, Tim takes a, a cup out of a drawer. Oh yeah. You know. I, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and that you know, Perfect. it's that whole thing. It feels so dangerous and yeah. uh, anachronistic. I, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, the, the the visual style of it. Um, 
there's there's a few things uh, again you you sort of see uh tim's visual sort of uh his vision of it there's that it's so it's this very wide angle shot it's kind of soft around the edges and sharp in the middle um it's got a very fast shutter so uh bob's drumsticks he almost looks animated you know that they don't smooth smoothly and all the water we see is sort of droplets falling through space uh, that's just tim's sort of I guess he would have just brought that as a fair accompli. Would that's not something you necessarily would have got much in on. He would have no, just, no. Yeah. The Smith, the Smith visual style was very, was very strong. Yeah. I mean, Tim. I know that working for him, working, <clears throat> excuse me, working on um, working on that stuff. It, it was a joy once, once for, for him once he got the kind of got the computer because I th I know he was he was sick of it. I mean, when he, he, you know, the edit that he did on Mare's Nest, which I, I think Mare's Nest is the greatest, the greatest rock live film ever. And Tim's like, all I can see is mistakes. What I would have yeah. given for another week. I know Tim worked around the clock on Mare's Nest because I think when it, when the original cut that came back, it was just like this won't do. Yeah. And um, you know, and so Tim worked, worked around the clock on getting Mare's Nest done. And and right, he looks amazing. And he used to work on these old U what U Matic machines, yeah. and um, you know. So, so I, I, I know it was kind of yeah. He, he, he really has this visual style. And if you look at all the, if you look at all the old, um, the videos that he's directed, Dark Star, Levitation, you know, Cardiacs, that he really, really has this very, very strong visual style. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Seaside Treats, the, the, the earliest sort yeah. of Cardiacs uh, long form thing, uh, is just amazing. And the idea that all of that was done with analog tape machines. What, how hard, you know, I, f I feel so lucky living in the, the digital age where editing stuff is pretty trivial, you know, and what a slog that must have been uh, well, working with working with those tapes. The thing, the thing about Tim, you know, the artist, Tim Smith, is, is that right from right from the out with Cardiacs, you know, it, it, it was never just about the music. You know, the look had to be right. The, the records had to look right. So he I, I hate this. I hate this phrase multimedia. But, you know, he had he, he had he, he'd got the whole thing covered. So right. Like you say, right. Going back to the, those really early videos and the seaside treat stuff. You know, he knew how he wanted this to look. He, he knew, he knew how, how he wanted it to sound, you know, going back to, you know, there's never been a Cardex record that was produced by anyone else. And increasingly, as technology moved on and everything became more affordable, then, he, and, you know, or even when things weren't more affordable. And I know he took out, he had to t take out an enormous loan to buy his, his mixing desk and his uh, two inch, um, you know, 24 track tape machines. Because he, as a, to be a producer, to, and you know that was his income really, because Cardiacs wasn't an income. So, as a producer and engineer, so Tim was a brilliant engineer. He was a brilliant producer. He's a brilliant, you know, editor. But you know, he really was the, you know, got the whole thing, kind of covered. Yeah. And what what's I, I, I wonder really, <clears throat> just how much he would have taken advantage if you take of, think of the last twelve years. What has what has happened? Sort of moved on, where now everybody's everybody's got to be all these things. Now that we've got the, you know, the way it is in the internet, these you know, just just to do one thing it almost makes you obsolete. I wonder how much Tim would have really taken on board, you know, and, and taken over what the, the 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 possibilities of what we have now with having a Cardiac's YouTube channel and, and and putting clips up and cutting things together and you know what they what they depressingly refer to as content. Imagine the content that Tim could have been devising to go with everything. I mean, I know now I'm, I learned so much from Tim in, in terms of you know, running, running a band, having the confidence to, to run my own band, and then learning about engineering, mixing, and producing your own stuff, so just, just becoming autonomous. And Tim was autonomous before you, you really could be. I mean, everyone, like I said, everyone has to be now. But in the 80s, Tim was totally autonomous, you know, yeah. and mixing and, and making these. He just found out how to, how to do stuff. He's very, very good at working stuff out. And I, I hope I don't spoil the Tim's myth, but he he was the only person I know that if if he got a new bit of kit would just read the instruction manual from cover to cover before even getting his hands dirty. I mean, the rest of us we get something and we want to plug it in. Oh, how does this work? But he he would read the instruction manual, you, you know, completely and or watch tuitional later on, watch you know online tuitions and stuff. So I can re you really get a, the same way that he would t he taught himself to write music from it was just kind of needs must with him and he's always had this like, overarching vision of everything and would just learn through any means necessary 
while not really having much money, just learn exactly how to do things. I mean, do, you know, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I, I've not really ever given that any thought because you, you listen to the early recordings where, the, you know, he's developing his abilities as an engineer and as a producer. Yeah. Uh, you look at the early videos where you're working with what was available and, and you see that nascent talent uh, waiting to happen. And then you see the development and you see the, the rotten shed, you know, you sort of go, yeah. you sort of go, wow, look, this is where this is developing. And I've never really given any thought to that of where would it have gone? Yeah, you know? yeah, I, I hadn't until just now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously, obviously, and Tim's very, very good. He's it, such a magnetic human being and, you know, such a warm, magnetic human being. And of course, and so insanely gifted that people want to be around him and helping. And let's not forget that all the way through uh, every stage, whether it's the Nick Elbrey on the, the yeah. Seaside Treat stuff or Roger Teber ed engineering and, you know, Dave Murder, he's always had people around him to help kind of, you know, help bolster or help, help him achieve his vision. But these are always people who love being around it because we just love being a part of this extraordinary, yeah, and it's extraordinary a shame. story. And it's a shame today because, you know, you've, when, when we're telling these stories, it's a shame to not call out all those people because there's loads of people yeah. who, and it's, there's always that risk. And as you say, um, I've met Nick and spoken to him and he, you know, he, you know, he did a lot of work on that. And it's, but again, as you say, very excited to, to, to work with Tim. Well, it's a know. joy to work with him because he's, he's just totally not an arsehole, you know. Yeah, yeah. What happened for the next uh, couple of years with Cardiacs? Where did that, where did that go? Well, we'd been, you know, we'd been talking for a while about, for a long time, <laughs> since I joined, about making a new record. Um, and, and what would happen, I think, I, I hope Tim doesn't mind me saying this, but what, what would happen is each, each year we'd play, at, you know, the Astoria, either tour in November, December, or play, the, you know, we just did the Astoria gig. And at the end, of, and we'd, we'd rehearse from the summer leading up to that gig or that, that tour. And then each time Tim would say, right, that's it, I'm going to just batten down the hatches, then we're going to start a new album. It's like, great, great. And then he'd take some work on. He'd take, you know, Ginger would have a big project or Scaramangas or whatever. He'd, he'd just take on to big work. And, uh, you know, I think Tim was, in fact, I'm pretty sure Tim was just basically sort of, it, it, was, a, it was a form of procrastinating, I think, of, of having to, you know, having to commit to this next Cardiacs record. Uh, but anyway, finally, it, got, it, it sort of got started to get to the point where, the booking agent was saying, you know, we'd be saying, can we have some tours? We want some bigger tours. And the booking agent would say, look, we can't, we can't really justify a tour unless you've got some new material out. And of course, I, I was very keen. Uh, Organ agreed to put out very quickly the Ditsy Scene mm -hmm. single, um, which is Ditsy Scene Jen and Made All Up. We recorded that stuff really quickly. Um, when I wrote the words for Ditsy Scene and wrote the words uh, for Made All Up with Tim, we did that pretty quickly and, and, and got it out. And then it, that was like that kind of released the blockage and it was like, yeah. okay, let's go. So Tim had a huge, um, I've got three CDs worth of songs that were kind of started and we just said, well, which one should we do? So we picked, we picked uh, a, a, you know, a, a number of songs uh, which, which went on to be, okay, well, this, this will become what, what we later named LSD. And so that was during the, we were recording that during 2008. So Bob came down and did his drums. And then I came over, um, there, there was some, there was bass on most of the tracks. I came over and spent uh, a few weeks doing the guitar parts and um, absolutely loved it. And we were working in the new, the new studio and Tim was just so kind of, focused on this um, that he was getting up I and mean, this wasn't like Tim at all he was getting up at eight in the morning and making me breakfast normally you know, I'd get up and have to really get him out of bed at midday and make him breakfast you know this time it's totally different just completely sort of focused on this and we started making you know making LSD and of course it sounded wonderful and um, I remember Mark Cawthra came over to see us and Tim said oh you've got to come and hear this and, and played Mark like what you know the, the work in progress and Mark said to me, Tim's never done that before. You know, Tim's never done okay. that. And w without wanting to, without wanting to, to sort of like pepper the expectation any, but Tim, Tim said, God, this feels like making On Land. This, I, I've got the same feeling making this album as I did with On Land. And certainly it was, it was really, really exciting. And again, I got to, 
I got kind of, if well, I, not exactly carte blanche, but I got, there were situations like there's one song which the, the working title was Skating, and there was a whole instrumental section, and Tim said, oh, can you like, can you just like come up with um, some sort of like kind of Fred Frithish and you know and he said oh actually well you know what to do just just do your thing Tim just went off into the office and left me in the studio for two or three hours he went into the office to do work you know cardiac work you know admin work and so I was just left in the studio coming up with this thing and then called him in and played it to him and it's like oh yeah good that's great and so I loved it I was I basically got to come up like come up with all my parts which which I pretty much think is how probably how John did it in Sing to God as well, but came up with loads of my own parts and started writing lyrics. I think Tim was sort of getting sick of writing lyrics. So I wrote loads of lyrics for the album as well, um, which, ne which never got recorded. And there the album remains, you know, yeah. in, in that state, which, you know, we're, we've been talking about for a while, finishing with a different singer. Yeah. And um, I think Craig Fortner may well be orchestrating it. So it's, you know, never say never, it will happen, but it will happen when, you know, Tim is able to produce it properly sort of thing um and then you know, the other thing that was happening i just remembered was um around the time 2008 was i was i had this record that i'd started recording in in 2001 like a solo album which was which became knife world and so i would be i decided i was going to mix it myself and i by this point i'd got cubase so i was sort of using it as well and I'd be sending Tim rough mixes and he'd say, oh yeah, this is good, but I think you need to turn the hi-hats down a bit and just getting mix advice. And Tim, he's, you know, probably doesn't want to know if he's a real, you know, total kind of like got a head on him about like geeky stuff. And so I would always be ringing him up for advice on, oh, how do I make it do this? How Because I was just getting my hand, my head around Cubase. Uh, and then the idea was also going to be that if I ever did Knife World Live, that Tim was going to play bass for it. But it was never going to be... I never saw it as being my big thing. I just thought, well, this will be this side thing that I do mm. because I'm in cardiacs now and I'm going to get to write songs and I'm going to write lyrics and what have you. Which, of course, then, you know, when, when Tim went down, Knife World became, at least for a while, the big, the big focus kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, what, what I'd learned so much just from, you know, how to run a band, how to, or, or at least, you know, how to try and have the confidence to run a big band and... <clears throat> You know, you know, from from working with Tim. Yeah, I yeah, think. yeah. And that's, I think that's the that's one of the things is Knife World, is you know, at times an eight piece. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and that's uh, especially in this day and age, uh, an incredibly ambitious thing. You know, yeah, it's very yeah, hard yeah. to. Yeah, What I learned, what I learned for Cardex is how to do a band and make no money at all. So yeah, yeah. Like Knife World was perfect. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that that sort of almost brings us up to date. Do, do you want to tell us a bit more? about um about what you've been doing i guess you know well, I, I mean was. again I, I never i never really had a plan all, all, all i've ever done is just go where you know i always wanted to follow what i call the bent path which was to, you know the the of this funny music whatever it was so i've never really done anything that i didn't feel 100 percent about and if i ha if i did then i I, us I usually sort of quit after a while so i've never really been a session player in any way and I thought that was it I thought that was it I've joined Cardiacs now I'm going to do this band I'm playing with my best mate you know what what more could I want so I really had to I mean I, I for, for a long time I sort of felt like I was working in the sort of shadow the post cardiac shadow I never planned on making Life World this band that it was but of course it did I was still doing Guapo who I was with already and then I got to know David Allen and got asked to join Gong and that that took my knife onto a a completely different trajectory. And so the David Allen thing. That, did you meet David through the radio show? Is that, is yeah, that how yeah, that I was doing a radio show yeah. again. Dude, Steve never planned that, but I thought, well, this seems like a good idea. Steve had asked me to do this radio show with him. I thought, well, this seems like a good idea. I'm into this, and so never planned on being a DJ. And then that led to actually, you know, actually DJing and going out and playing weird music to people again on on our terms. And again, joining Glock Gong. I never pl planned on being in Gong, and I certainly never planned on fronting gong in fact what i loved about initially joining gong like with cardiacs is oh great i don't have to i don't have to front this band i don't have to sing i can just concentrate on playing guitar and then david allen had the the selfishness to die and uh, yeah. in, insist you know insist that the band carry on so but, ex but expressly wanted you to lead it in, yeah in, yeah yeah and that's that's the unusual thing yeah it was he, yeah he had the sort of the foresight and the prescience to sort of say this is what how I'd like you to continue. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And uh, you know, initially I wasn't into it, but in the end, you know, while he was still alive, thankfully, said, "Okay, I will do this." You know, we did a tour 
We did a tour without David Allen because we had to do it because the gigs were booked and David was just undergoing cancer treatment. And I thought, this is never going to work, you know, and it did work and people liked it. And I, you know, there's some people that say no gong, no David Allen, no gong, which I, I totally understand. It was never my, never my dream to, to be fronting this other band, but it, it, it couldn't be all that what I, I couldn't only do gong because I, you know, I have to, I have to be doing lots of other things as well. Yeah. I, and well, you I, said earlier on as well, there's a sort of framework to gong about yeah. what you can do. Whereas I suppose with Knife World and your solo stuff, there are no such or, barriers or... There are, but the, you know, self-created, self yeah, yeah, yeah. the mind for Germanicals, you know, the self-created yeah. ones. Yeah. But, you know, um, I think one, one thing I've learned over the last, well, probably 20 years, the last 10 years, is that I, I do play nicely with others, you know. I think I'm, 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 I can be quite annoying. I can definitely be quite controlling, but I think I'm, I'm pretty good being in a band with people. Um, and, you know, I can only do my thing. But I've, I've, I've always liked putting myself into different situations where whatever that thing is flourishes in a different way. So I have this band, The Utopia Strong, which always starts off with improvisation. Well, I've never really, I'd, I've always improvised in rehearsals, but never really rehearsed, improvised much live. So with Gong, we were doing a bit of that, but The Utopia Strong is completely improvised. Well, I really like my role as one of the three wheels in that band that makes that band work. Just, can you just quickly talk about Utopia Strong about uh, exactly who's in it and well, what their roles are. The, the Utopia Strong is um, Mike York from Coil, who plays bagpipes, uh, various wind instruments and modular synth, and Steve Davis from Snooker, who plays modular synth um, and had never played in a band before, but has exquisite taste, you know, and has very, very, well, I say that, very similar taste to me. <laughs> uh, and um, is, is, you know, has just, and I think that's the key to music. And I've, I've played with a lot of musicians who are terrific players, but have no taste at all. And you, you have to tell them, you have to stop playing that. You know, you'll be recording, they'll come up with a part and you just go, you have to not play that, that sounds terrible. Yeah. You know, what on earth are you thinking, you know? Yeah. But I think you, but Steve doesn't do that. You know, nothing, nothing ever comes out of his modular synth. I think, Shut up, mate. You know, or dial it back. He's just because he's got great taste, and I think that's the key to being a, a, at least a composer. Yeah. Is you have to have good taste because uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of people that like to listen to lots and lots of notes, but yeah, yeah. the arbitrary notes for their own sake. But yeah. I'm, I'm not one of them. You know? I, I remember that when uh, Michael McKean talking about Spinal Tap, saying that pe you know some people didn't get it that 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 they're great players, but they just have horrible taste. Yeah, you know? yeah that's and the, the, that's the, the, you know, that's the and joke. And the, the key to, the key to, I, I had to, the key to prog rock, I think a lot of prog rock, you know, a, a term I really don't like, and certainly the modern prog rock is it's really amazing players with no taste at all, mm. you know? And you just need to look at the album covers to see that, mm. you know, even the album covers, yeah, great artists with no taste, you mm. know? <laughs> Would you really want this as your cover? But, you know, yes, lots of work's gone so, into it. So, um, I think we're close to closing. Let's talk, you specifically talking about um, album covers and talking uh, uh, about what you're up to. You've got a solo album out, which mm -hmm. you did. What's what, tell me about the sleeve art and then tell me a bit about the album. Yeah, well, the hip to the jag was um, I, I drew the cover myself. I decided. Um, well, actually, with coronavirus, it, 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 it really made things even more interesting. But basically, I thought, well, making this solo album, mainly because I was so busy with Gong and the Utopia Strong to do Knife World, and Knife World's a big, a big, big undertaking because there's eight of us and you have to get, these are eight, seven other busy musicians, you have to get all the schedules to sort of coincide. And it, it's kind of, it, it takes an enormous amount of energy. And also, because there's eight of us, I always want to write for all eight people. I don't want to write a song that's just bass, guitar and drums and leave the others out. So I want to write these big, sort of quite grandiose arrangements, you know, which, take, which takes a lot of, a, a lot of energy. And so I didn't have the time or energy for the last couple of years to do Knife World, although it's, it's, it's very much, you know, going to gonna happen again. But, um, but I was writing these songs, so I just wanted to make this, you know, I, I started recording this record, which t turned into a solo album. And I wanted to go out and perform by myself, which again was a whole new dynamic. I'd never, I'd never done it before. I'd never just stood by myself. And it's, it's terrifying. Um, and it's totally different from playing in a band so that was a whole new skill to learn I think I'm starting to I'm starting to get there now I found my yeah. I found my persona because you can't go out with the big 
the gong persona, you've got these amazing, like the big stages and these incredible projections, and you've got to really be that guy fronting it. Well, these smaller intimate things, you can't come out and be that guy. You've got to, it's still you, but you've got to be a, you know, a, a yeah. different version of you. So I, I found that guy over doing all these gigs and I started writing these tunes to perform. And then thought, well, I'd like to make a record of this. Well, with, you know, with, with um, you know, with Knife World, I'd, I'd, I'd tend to write the songs as a whole arrangement. So there's only really a handful of Knife World tunes that I could sit and play them on the guitar and sing them. And you go, all right, that's that one. I mean, usually if you just hear the guitar part, it doesn't make a great deal of sense until you hear the, what the keyboard's doing in the holes and the horns are doing over it. And the, so I, I sort of wanted to, I wanted to be able to just write some songs that I could go and perform, particularly at the drop of a hat. If someone said, well, are you free on the, you know, are you free on the 16th of August? Go, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Without having to send out an email, guys, what, then book a load of rehearsals, book a hotel, get a van. You know, it's just like, yeah, I can do that. So I started um, writing songs that, that I knew worked with just initially guitar, but then just harmonium and voice. Yeah. And then what I'd do, I'd, I'd record those basic elements down and then build up the arrangements on top of them, knowing that when I had to go and perform them live, they would still stand up just as these sort of more spectral kind of arrangements. And then I'd kind of got, I'd always enjoyed drawing, but I'd stopped for years. And then when I became a parent, I've got, got into drawing again. I thought, oh, it'd be nice to, it'd be nice to really make this a solo album. So record it myself, mix it myself, do everything myself. And then, do you know what? I'll put it on my own label as well. I'll go back on my own. Well, for some reason, and it turned out to be quite uh, sort of prescient, prescient, is that the word? When you'd see, is that Car Cargo, the distributors, had offered to distribute it. And then for some reason, I was speaking to my friend Catherine Blake, and she'd just done a Medieval Babes album and done it all completely herself, sending out all the orders, and actually, shock horror, made some money from it. Well, you, you never make money out of... You know, despite being signed to record labels, you almost never make money out of albums. You, you make them from the gigs and what have you. So I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to do this all myself. And then, of course, all the record shops shut anyway. Mm. And it ended up being just the right thing to do at that time. And I ended up, you know, uh, uh, you know, apart from yourself taking the photos, normally I would have got you to do the video. But because of lockdown, I ended up making the video myself. Yeah, yeah. And it ended up, it was nice just doing the, just doing the whole making this whole record by myself and everything to do. I did the PR. It really was, you know, a, a true solo album. And it's, it's been great because I think, well, OK, I know I can do that now. Now the next one, I can do it like that. I yeah. quite, and, and it was good to have the time to do it as well. Has anything that you've sort of started as a Carver Sarabi track, you've thought it's, it might turn into a Knife World track, for example, that, 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 or has it all stayed very much in that framework? Well... The other, the other way, the, the other, yeah. The, during during lockdown, I've started working on the second album, the, the second uh, solo album. I mean, writing this stuff and thinking, oh, this would be great with some drums. Oh, it'd be great. Yeah. Wouldn't this sound good with the bassoon doubling? That? And it's like th these are Knife World tunes, you know. Yeah. So, so I've been I've been writing, and I've already written a few songs that really weren't for Gong, because I know how I want them to go. And you can't you can't really bring a song into Gong. I can bring you bring ideas into Gong, or you can. But we, we hash it out together. But these ones are kind of, I can hear them completed. It's like, yeah, this is a knife world. I too. think I think the first, if I'm right, the first solo gig you did, I think you did with Chloe. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, so she was, joined so, me. Yeah. So, you, so you had a bit of a security Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That, was, that so is I've right, yeah. You, I've seen you sort of, it did start out a little bit clunky. And it was like, really you, clunky, you know, yeah. You know, and it's seeing it evolve. Yeah. And like you say, developing into something uh, compact that you can, yeah. that you can, drop into a, a, a venue and do a show. So It's so different to Knife World and, and to Cardiac. So yeah, I'm, I'm really, really into it now. I mean, I'd love to do a, love to do a proper tour with this stuff and when, when lockdown's over, because I can do it in a car. I can do it on a train, but I can definitely do it in a car. And it's just easy, just one of me. So, yeah, I'd love to do that. Going back to this film, what your sort of fondest sort of memories are of that time? What, what, what's sort of, what do you take from it? Um, what from from being in cardiac? I or think that, so. That, that, maybe yeah. that whole that because that's that period, you know. That, that, the extraordinary the extraordinary friendships uh, in and around that band, which I, which to be honest, I came in on in nineteen ninety four when I when I when I got asked to guitar tech, yeah. you know, which was completely um, bizarre because I didn't I'd met Tim a few times <clears throat> at cardiac shows and he'd been seen my band the Monsoon Bassoon, but we didn't really know each other. He must have had a nice he must have. He must, knowing how Tim works, he must have got a good feeling from me because 
Tim only ever wants to work with his friends. So, you know, you, 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 you wouldn't get an audition. Like, he would have only got John Pooling because he had a good feeling about John. Yeah. He would never get someone in just because they were a good musician or something. They'd have to be the right person. Um, so, so, but from being in there, from my, my first tour, really, which was on a bus, tour bus, and that Chumbawamba support tour, just realising that these people were just like my friends in Plymouth. They're just yeah. crazies, you know, just a bunch of total beautiful clever, funny, hedonistic, you know, anarchistic, hedonistic, just non-judgmental, crazy people, just beautiful people. And of course, not, not just, a, you know, not just the band, but everybody around the band and everyone who used to be in the band and everyone who surrounded the band and all these friends and the, just the social life that went with it. I mean, Cardiacs was, it wasn't just those gigs. It was everything. It was every gig we went to. For, throughout the 90s, Tim and I, and John and Bick and Dawn, my wife, and Joe Spratley. And, you know, all of us would just be in Camden, going to gigs, going to see CDB Sire, going to see Ark, going to see Nub, going to see, you know, um, Dark Star, uh, going to see Evil Superstars, just always going out to gigs, then going back to one of our houses and partying all night and then going to someone else's. It was just this mad, incredibly beautiful social life, but it never felt sort of dark or, even though we were really hedonistic, it was never, grim or dark or kind of like the, the dark side of rock and roll. It just felt really, really fun. And you know, well, there's, Tim... there's, there's a lovely line in the film where Tim is being interviewed and he says, you know, people don't leave this band. They, yeah. they can drive, they, they, they can't, they're not allowed. They don't. Yeah, yeah they can't, they you know. You know they... It is a whole world, isn't it? It's a, it's a sort of little, this people, we talk about this, this sort of, it's, it lacks a name really, but this sort of cardiac seen this cardiac world you know, yeah that tim's sort of at the center of and there are threads just to the these really wide corners you know where all sorts of bands all sorts of people and certainly for me you know loads of people i know loads of music i love has all has all come from that one central spot in the universe yeah. and tim as, as craig fortnum said tim tim ra raised the bar so high it get even if you know, we don't sound like cardiacs, and and I'm always I'm always actually ambivalent. Unfortunately, you know, when when bands say, "Oh yeah, you should hear this," you should hear this. It really sounds like cardiacs. Uh, like, oh right, does it? Uh, does yeah. it really? Yeah, and of course, yeah. it never, it never. Yeah, it sound it sounds. You know, superficially. It, yeah, superficially. You know, I'm not I'm not interested in that. You know, I'm only interested in cardiacs in that respect. Absolutely. But he, it's just how how high he, he you know how high he raised that bar. I had a real epiphany. Um, was it last year when Tim had? Tim got given his doctorate and Nick Elbra had put together, I gave it, you know, Tim was getting made a doctor and I gave a little speech along with Jim and Sean Kitching and, uh, you know, Richard played and Bill played songs and Sharon and what have you. Um, and Nick Elbra had made this film, this sort of like, I don't know, 20 minute film sort of about cardiacs. And cardiacs had been sort of cast such a long shadow certainly after Tim went down in 2008, had, had really haunted my days and sort of cast this really long shadow and I'd only ever really seen it. I'm, try, I'm trying to describe how I felt. I re, I, there was a sort of grimness for me about the of post-cardiacs and being, you know, being, you know, the, the sort of sadness of what had well, happened. You, you, you had The Unravelling, your record, which is yeah. really all about that. You yeah, know? it really and, was. And yeah. there was so, so much melancholy in that. There was so much ruefulness yeah for that time and i hadn't realized how much i was how, how you know how much i was in this post cardiac state and then nick elbred and, and we've all moved on now we're all we, we, we're all the sort of you know it's lovely to see sarah there and all the 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 all these beautiful old people old, old friends not old people but but to watch that film and to watch this bit of early it was just like a sort of montage of early stuff and cut together and then then to see the point at which i came in <clears throat> and to see those bits all cut together and then to see it end and to see then to realize to see it as the whole story and think oh yeah there's that story and I remember I got the same excitement when you get the, you saw these early clips I got the same excitement as I did when I was a fan seeing them for the first time when a friend of mine had got a bootleg video which had like car cardiacs at the Surbiton assembly rooms and oh god there they are listening out for Tim saying certain bits and oh look they're playing that bit slightly different I got all that rush of excitement of what it was to be a fan and then to see myself up there but kind of removed from myself seeing me like 10 or 12 years ago up there 
and go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I was part of that story, wasn't I? Yeah. And it was such a nice story. And even the fact that LSD didn't get completed, it sort of didn't matter. It was like, what a beautiful thing to have all been part of. And it's, things have changed so much and we're all still friends. And it's, I can't quite explain what it was, but just this real feeling of, oh, wasn't that nice to be part of that? Wasn't that a nice thing to be just at the end of that story, just the last few years? But yeah, I was in that. I was part of it. I was in the, la I was in the final chapter. You know, and wasn't that good? And then looking around the room and there was all the other people that have been, have since become, you know, my friends and all these kids that have been born, including my own, as a result of that. And these extremely close friends that will, will be with me till I die. And it's like, didn't we do a, what, didn't we do a lovely thing? And what an incredible thing Tim created there. Yeah. And aside from this music that people will know him for and what you see, you know, what you don't see behind the curtain, the whole cardiac thing, just this incredible beauty that went on behind it and just this incredible team of exceptional human beings fantastic thank you very much you're welcome Brilliant.